This is Dr. Herbert Harris, and this is another edition of Success Talk. This is a program where we talk to people who have achieved incredible things, but in achieving those things, they have faced obstacles, barriers, difficulties, challenges, and yet they've made breakthroughs to be what they want to be, to do what they want to do, and to have anything they desire. And tonight we have, I call him a fellow traveler, (laughs) (laughs) Steve Hutchinson, coming to us from Nashville, Tennessee. Steve, welcome to Success Talk. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. You know, it's, it's actually, it is a great benefit. You know, it's a great benefit to be here. I think this is a culmination of my travels. This mm. is like a stamp that, mm. see, you can, you can, you can, you can. Oh, man, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you this. I was reading, we'll talk about your book. But I was reading some of the things in your book, Power Thoughts, and so many of the vibrations there. I'm like, yeah, yeah, man, I could have written that. I know exactly what (laughs) you're talking about. And, and, you know, I think when you tune into the universal consciousness, then there's the one mind and we're able to perceive and plug into that one mind. and, And then the creativity part is that we're able to then share it. And you did a great yes. job on that, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. I completely agree with that. Absolutely. Well, Steve, tell us a little about your background, because you travel in so many levels and so many places, and that very often people never know the extent of your journey, you know, where you started from and how you got where you are. Just give a little brief over overview of where you grew up and you know what the early part of your life was like okay well here's a synopsis i was born in 1959 in new york city i was born with x-ray vision Mm. i could actually see the sincerity or the insincerity in people and of course this caused me a lot of conflict and a lot of heartache and a lot of disappointment and a lot of frustration to be able to see like that and to have my environment keep telling me to stay in my place, stay Mm -hmm. in my place. And I traveled all throughout the US being born in New York. I was exposed to many, many things, many, many different levels of existence and different types of thinkers, everything from from sidewalk philosophers to great teachers to very wealthy people. And I wind up myself wanting to escape from New York. By the Mm. time I was 25, I was ready to escape. Mm. I was about to implode in depression, frustration, and a lack of self-development, personal self-development. So I then began some traveling. I traveled through all 50 states, meditated through all 50 states, and finally arrived at a state of consciousness where I am able to accept myself and my self-esteem and define myself. And I was even able to cross vibrations with a great personality like yourself. Wow. And here I am. Man, (laughs) what a journey. What a journey. Absolutely. You know, as you as you move into your as you travel through the different places, the different stages, is there anything that really surprised you? You know how you learn something and 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 you become amazed or surprised. You're like, man, I'm surprised that that is true. Is anything that really surprised you in your in your journeys? Interesting. Yeah, actually, yes. You know, the most surprising things to me were actually the, 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 the fallacy or the frailties of human beings. Mm. That was very surprising to me. The, the, the frailty, the, 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 um, the, 
the the lack of depth of mm. people how mm. plastic people could be how people could actually put on a whole charade and a whole parade and be completely false mm. that was a, a surprise to me yes uh because being a an insightful person I've always had a, a good sense of perception. Mm. That was one great gift that I believe I had and was given was the sense of perception. So I could actually see through this, but it was mm. still surprising to me. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. surprising to see that people are so, so thin. Thin. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, well, you know, as, as you were saying, being a young person with x-ray vision, being able to see, it's really to be able to see the hearts and the authenticity of other people. You know, I can see how that could be really a challenge because, you know, many people look in the mirror and still lie to themselves about how they look. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and so when you are able to see the person in their authenticity or lack thereof, it's a pride. And, 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 you know, I think uh, when you were saying that, I was thinking people have been very successful, made a ton of money. I mean, uh, based on the world standards, have been able to do quite well still with that inauthentic a representation of themselves. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. That, and that's something like, for instance, um, it was, it was a very interesting thing for me to learn, for instance, that a person could have, could go to school and get a doctorate in finance mm -hmm. and still in practical application, be financially illiterate. Mm. Wow. Now that's Don't, deep. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm sure you, you, you have experienced it yourself. People can have all this academic accomplishment, even in the field of finance and the economy and, 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 and currency, but still in their personal observation, in their personal execution, you see, this person is financially literate because they still don't understand basic fundamental mm -hmm. principles of paying yourself, first mm -hmm. of, of accumulating passive income of having multiple streams of income they still don't get it they don't grasp those wow. simple things that's interesting man because uh, so many people are like that i mean they can it's almost like they learn one thing but it's really a facade they don't internalize mm -hmm. what they've learned they don't live it yeah as they say there are a lot of people who talk the talk but very few who walk the talk yes and that's, sir that's really i think what you're saying that 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 there are people who are able to achieve great things but still as you say financial literacy there are a lot of people making tons of money and still don't understand anything about money <laughs> that you know so these are just like surprising things to me so life is very humorous in that way, you know, mm -hmm. to discover these things. Because I read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm -hmm. by Robert Kiyosaki. And that very thin, very small, very basic, simple book just like illuminated me tremendously in financial literacy. Uh -huh. Just tremendously. Things I had never actually heard. And I had read quite a few books before that. I love reading. I, love, I read all different types of books, but my financial literacy understanding was definitely, you know, energized and, and by quantum leaps, by understanding the way people think about money. Mm. Because I, I was always taught just about like the physical manifestation of money, like mm -hmm. what you do, you know, you, you got to work to make money, you got to save some money, you got to plan for the future, all that. But the mindset of different people with those very same instructions, results are going to be tremendously different. different. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, you know, now that sounds like was that the foundation of your whole desire now of helping people achieve financial literacy? Absolutely. Absolutely. That that's one of my definite motivations. You know, like one of the things from specifically from that I learned about the cash flow quadrant. Uh-huh. For instance, in the cla- the cash flow quadrant, you know, illustrates there are four different quadrants of four different divisions. Uh-huh. And not only are they different means in which people acquire their revenue, because everyone has to generate revenue. Basically, right. One of the universal laws that I understood about planet Earth, if we're going to be here, we're going to have to pay to be here. Yes, yes. They ain't going to be free. That's it. No such thing as a free lunch. No, you know, and Mm -hmm. we're going to pay. And pay doesn't always mean with dollars and coins and sterlings and pounds or, you know, rubles. But pay, we got to pay with time. We got to pay with effort. We got to pay with concentration. We got to pay with labor. We got to pay with, you know, with effort. Mm -hmm. So we got to pay. So since we're going to pay, we may as well understand what this whole paying thing is all about. Well, that that caught that cash flow quadrant. And maybe for many of our listeners, maybe you could just give a a quick little snapshot of what that's about, because that may help them. Yes. The cash flow quadrant divides income into four different categories. Mm-hmm. You have or you have, so you have the left side of the quadrant and you have the right side of the quadrant. On each mm-hmm. side of the quadrant, you have two quadrants. So if we start on the left, this mm-hmm. is my left over here, you have the employee, and below the employee, you have the self-employed. Mm-hmm. So those are two quadrants. And 95% of and let's say human or, or let's say uh, American population, 95% of the people fall in those two quadrants. Mm-hmm. They're either employees or they are self-employed. Okay. Then on the right side of the quadrant, you have the business owner and you have the investor. 5% mm-hmm. of the population is on the right side of the quadrant. And what I like to say, that means that 95% are on the wrong side of the quadrant. Mm-hmm. And those divisions are people who are employees, and each category represents actually a mindset, mm. an attitude towards money, yes. an attitude towards life, and an attitude about themselves, mm-hmm. about their self image. Mm-hmm. You know, because everything is psychologically backed. Yes. Our behavior is supported by our psychology. Yes. Whether yes. we make the connection or not, but yes. everything we're doing is based on an internal programming. Yes. So yes. the employees, you know, they, they are satisfied with, you know, pretty much working for someone else and kind of being dependent on the economy and the circumstances and the laws and the rules and the so forth. So they work and, and then they get paid. Yes. You do some work, you get your pay. Yeah. Cool. Then you got the self-employed, which are not necessarily working for someone else, but now we work for ourselves. Mm-hmm. But we still have this very same principle that mm-hmm. I have to work for money. That's the predominant attitude on the left side of the quadrant is that uh-huh. I got to do the work uh-huh. to get paid. Uh-huh. I don't do no work. I don't make no money. Right. So the employee is satisfied with allowing someone else to pay them. And the self-employed thinks, no, I'm the man, I'm the boss, I'm the man, I'll answer the phones, I'll mm-hmm. sell the products, I'll do the marketing, I'll cash the checks, I'll mm-hmm. open the bank account. I'm Superman, I'll do everything. Yes. Another hard worker. Then you have the business owner. The business owner has a different mentality where they think, oh, let me create a system whereby I can engage others in work. Mm-hmm. Yes. Others, and so let me use a system, buy a system, or create a system whereby I could place others and I can free my mind and free my time so I could be creative in other ways. I could mm-hmm. give direction. I can make decisions. These are more decision makers. Yes. Right? Yes. They're not so much interested in flipping the burgers. 
as they are in trying to figure out how can I have a hundred thousand people flipping burgers? Yes. Right. What kind of yes. system could I could I put in place? Yes. Right. And then you have the investors. That's the 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 other category. The investors are those who look at this whole scenario, and they figure out how they can, in a passive way, capitalize on the entire system mm. by using their assets to produce and create other assets. Yes. Wow. You know, you have said so much there. And I, you know, I love that book, by the way. I love that book. And he, you know, he made it, I'll say simplistic. It's like once you hear it, once you get an understanding of the cash flow quadrant. And I'll tell you, uh, Steve, Stephen, you have really done one of the one of the most succinct, clear explanations of it. That you Thank know, you. as they say, Ray Charles could see that and say, Stevie, take a look. <laughs> 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 wow. But you know, that's um. That's a serious mission because so many people don't have a clue about money, investments, business, or any of those things. And so uh, I, I salute you and applaud your, your, this mission of um, financial literacy. How, how do you think it's going? I mean, like, what are your, your, your plans to start putting that into action? And how do you think the world's going to really benefit from it? Well, I think I take it pretty personal myself. I'm taking it like very personal. So I feel that my obligation is first to help myself, help my loved ones, my family, to help my people, help my culture. Mm -hmm. And then those fruits will, the, the bounty of those fruits will like overflow. Our cup shall overflow and everyone will benefit. Okay. Um, so that's the way I plan it and that's the way I look at it and therefore I'm using my company power tax I'm a tax pro I do income taxes my objective with my tax company is to one of my first goals is to create 100 black tax professionals mm -hmm. right and the other thing that I do with my company is that all of our clients, we don't just do their tax returns, but we also infuse them with financial literacy. Mm -hmm. We answer their questions. So we don't do a rush. First thing is that we take the whole idea that we got to rush and get this done real quick. Like put that aside. We're not rushing people. Mm -hmm. We're going to answer their questions and we're going to explain to them what's going on in their tax returns so they can increase their financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So that we can become, we can make money, but at the same time, we can enrich people with well, financial literacy. Well, you know, Steve, I think that's a great mission because every year I see so many people go through the same thing at the end of the year when they're doing their taxes. They're scrambling, they're putting stuff together and with no real purposeful intention about taxes, just another aspect of, you know, like financial literacy. Yes. And, and you can either work for you or work against you. Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, when you look back over your life and, you know, I mean, you've had many challenges. Can you think of one or two really big challenges that uh, confronted you and, and how did you get through them? Well, when I was a, approximately 21, when I was around 21 years old, it was the first time that I left New York City on my own. A friend of mine, he was older than me, and he was a teacher of mine. I was going to New York Business School. I'm from New York City. That's where I was born and raised, born in Manhattan, and was raised there. I met him, actually, after I came out of prison. Mm. I was in prison for two years for like a, a petty crime. And when I came out, I had already, I made up my mind when I was in prison that I wasn't going to be a prisoner. I said, mm -hmm. wait, I think you chose the wrong profession, buddy. You're not a prisoner. You're not mm -hmm. a gangster. You're not a murderer. You're not a mm -hmm. killer. You're not any of those things. You're not a pimp. You're not none of that. Even though those things were glamorized when I was a child. 
that I thought that's what I wanted to be. Uh -huh. But as soon as I lost my freedom, uh -huh. my mind said, are you sure this is the path you want to take? And uh -huh. I said, hell no, this is uh -huh. not the path I want to take. So I came out, I decided to go to a business school because I want to start a business of my own. And I met a friend who then subsequently moved to Houston, Texas and invited me to get out of New York City. He said, why don't you take a break, get out of the city, come down here just for some time, clear your head, make some decisions. And actually I was going to go to law school mm. uh, because my, and I know that you're an attorney, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, I was gonna go to law school. I was gonna go to the University of Houston, um, but that didn't work out. So I went to Houston Community College and while I was there at the age of 21, I fell into a very, very deep depression. Yeah. Um, suicidal depression. Mm. Um, now I was working at Taco Bell though. So I don't know, that, that could have been it. Working at Taco Bell, that can mm. make you pretty depressed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was <laughs> working at Taco Bell that made me feel suicidal or not, but actually felt suicidal in more than one occasion i was actually like crying uncontrollably not able to function properly but i was reading i was reading a book called the art of loving mm. and i was reading another book uh, called the sri ishopanishad the sri ishopanishad is from the vedas from the hindu tradition Mm. I was reading those books and I was learning from my friend, my mentor, uh, Mr. Mays. And I was able to overcome that, that valley, that darkness. It got really dark, very, very dark. And I was able to overcome because I think at that point, I began to get some philosophical understanding about life. And with the philosophical aspects, I was able to put things into perspective. Well, you know, Steve, I, I, very often I hear that when people are in a state, a negative state, that it seems that it's very important that somebody help you get out of it. And then also important that you listen and accept the help. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's absolutely. That's absolutely the case, mm -hmm. you know, guidance. And, and the guidance is, may appear to be coming from outside of us, but actually my ultimate conclusion is that that guidance is coming from within us. Mm. It's, like, it's like our self being projected outside of ourselves to help ourselves. Like there's this terminology called autodidact, mm -hmm. right? So the, the autodidact, Auto meaning self, uh -huh. didact meaning taught or teacher, that uh -huh. one can actually be self-taught. Uh -huh. And I had never heard of such a concept before because growing up in America, going through the 12 years of school and, you know, we're always taught that everything that we need is outside of ourselves. Mm. All of our authorities, all information, all the knowledge, all the accomplishments, all the wealth, all anything worth pursuing, love, everything is outside of ourselves. Once we get a grip and understand that actually the entire universe and everything is accessible from within, mm. that completely changes our external world. Well, yes. well, you know, you know, Stu, that's that's a great point, man. Because the word educate, I think it comes from the Latin educare, which mm -hmm. means to draw out. Mm. And so, in a sense, education, probably in its highest level, is drawing out what's already there. Just thinking of it in the creational aspect that. As creation, as created beings of an all-knowing master, God, the creator, mm -hmm. that we are completed 
we are created complete. But as a result of our backgrounds and our circumstances and who raised us and the environment in which we were raised and all kinds of other things, that completion may be hidden. Sometimes it's hidden under trauma. Sometimes it's hidden under poverty, maybe hidden under, you know, negative conditions. But when you have someone, almost a, a, a spiritual Moses, to like reach in and share certain ideas with you, certain thoughts with you, those, th and I love what you were saying, those thoughts were already there, but the person was able to help you bring them out. Mm. Yes. I, I, I ultimately believe that everyone is a Moses for us, mm. for me. Mm -hmm. So it, it's as though analogously, it's like everyone who appears within my environment and within my realm are to a degree created or attracted by me. And mm. to me, I'm, yes. I'm, I am, I'm, my source is a creator. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I can't help but create, even if I didn't want to create. I don't think we even have a choice to create. We can right. create madness, yes. right? We can create poverty. We can create disease. We can create misery. We can create prisons. Yes. Or we can create prosperity. We can create joy. We can create power. We can create love. We can create whatever we want to create. Yes, yes. So the argument is not with the creation. It rests with the creator. With the creator. Mm. And we create our lives. You know, there's a, I don't know if you ever read Neville, Neville Goddard. Neville. I've read some. Yes. yes. And it's, it talks about that, that we are all like, and, and I guess sort of Shakespeare, we all are in this play of life, but we are all the, play, we are the star performer we're the director we're the producer <laughs> we're the financier we're the janitor to clean up the mess that's and right yeah yeah that yeah that's that's beautiful man so now when this person helped you get through this this dark period what was it that 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 that, that really you were able to hang on to 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 come out of that you might say suicidal that that period of lostness I had, I had a desire to accomplish something. Mm. I wanted to accomplish something. So since I had a desire to accomplish something, I couldn't, I couldn't fully give up. I could not totally give up. Uh -huh. And my mentor, because of his example and the way he was dealing with life and dealing with challenges, gave me hope that I could deal with life, that I could face it. I could face life because I saw him facing it. He was dealing with it. Mm -hmm. He was dealing with life and he was maintaining his, his selfness, his self-esteem, maintaining his belief in himself, maintaining his positivity. And we are, you know, walking on the same planet. So I figured, well, him being able to do it, that gave me hope. I could mm -hmm. do it too. Yeah. I can do it. But that's important, man. That, you know, what you're just sharing there is so important. Number one, I love to hit these learning, learning points. That many times when you live your life as an example, you never know who you're impacting. Yes. You know, it's one thing when people tell you how to do it and give you all these instructions. But it's another thing when they live it themselves and you see how they make it work. And so that was Absolutely. a blessing. That was a blessing there. Mm, mm, mm. Definitely. Definitely. That's, um, that's, that's enlightenment. I, I, I really believe in enlightenment, mm -hmm. that we are all enlightened beings, but we do not acknowledge our enlightenment. Mm. Like I, and that's the way I began my book, Power Thought, with uh -huh. acknowledgement. If I don't yes. acknowledge, I yes. can't have the knowledge. Yes, yes. Wow, wow. Now, coming out of that period, so once you got through that, what, 
what was the the transformation that took place what who was the new steve after that that transformation with with your friend and coming out of that dark space yeah the the new person was someone who had to do something and had to make some decisions it's like mm -hmm. it was time to make some decisions now uh-huh right it was time to get off the the teeter totter you know going back and forth so i had to make some decisions and what i was about to make a decision i said what am i going to do with my life mm. i was a 25 year old black man in new york mm -hmm. who did not inherit any wealth or inherit a system for success that I could understand clearly. Mm -hmm. So what was I going to do? And I had to make decisions. So I came to a position where I started making decisions. I said, I got to make decisions with my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So that, I believe that that transformed me into that. It transformed me into a decision maker mm -hmm. that you got to make a decision and you got to make the decision yourself for your own life. Yes, yes. Now, you know, anytime there's a decision, you know, I often go back to the principle, a decision is the seed of a vision. Mm -hmm. And when you made that decision, what was the vision that you were moving toward? To become self-sufficient and to become self-satisfied mm. and to become, to be able to support and care for myself, my physical well-being, uh -huh. my psychological well-being, and my spiritual well-being. Mm. At this point, I was more aware that they existed. I did not know exactly or had much experience on how to cultivate them, but mm. I knew at this stage that I had to become self-sufficient. I could not depend on others I, mm. I was going so at the age of 25 you know when we go from the age of like say 14 15 on through the age of 21 it's a very volatile age because we're going from being a teenager a very dependent teenager to so-called being independent adult but there's no real training right mm. like yeah. in in many african cultures you know, they have, um, they have training where you go from being a boy to becoming a man. Yes. So my training was unofficial, but that was what I was crossing. So crossing through that stage of being a boy and being dependent and thinking I could do whatever I want to do, but not be held responsible mm. to actually becoming legally responsible now. Mm -hmm. Now you feed yourself. Let me see you do that. Mm -hmm. You care for yourself. Let me see you do that. You get your own shelter. You have your own resources. So that was the stage that I came to at that point. Wow. Yeah. And that then led you into uh, now. Now, when you moved from there, what did you how did you decide to go into business for yourself? Well, that came. I wanted to go into business previously uh, and I did not do it uh, successfully. So what happened was I decided that I have to take care of myself. I was living in New York. So I said, I got to take care of myself. So I had a couple of choices. It was 1984. I was going to join the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I had a theory in mind because I had been going to college. I was going to Hunter College because my idea was I wanted to be an attorney. Uh -huh. Now, I wanted to be an attorney because my brother pretty much like he just ingratiated that idea with me. He always told me since I was about 10 years old, you, you should be a lawyer. You should be a lawyer. You're going to uh -huh. be a lawyer. Be a lawyer, be a lawyer, be a lawyer. So I was thinking like that. I was actually going to college sometime. I went to Hunter College. I was taking pre-law. Mm -hmm. classes to go to college and I had an experience I was so determined to become a lawyer that I got a job at a community center 
And I started looking for a job and I actually found a job at a law firm on Park Avenue mm -hmm. in New York City. Okay. Pretty much as an apprentice, as a file clerk, uh -huh. I got a job as a law firm. I was like, so focused on that. I got the job and started working there and things were going fair. You know, they were pretty much using me like a messenger. Uh -huh. Right. So I was under an OJT contract, an on the job training contract. Uh -huh. And I knew that I was here to be trained as a file clerk. Mm -hmm. So after, I don't know exactly how long it was, may have been a week or two, I wanted to sit down with the attorneys at the law firm uh, to confront them about my position being there mm -hmm. and about me being trained as a file clerk or uh, my messenger, like uh -huh. what's going on here. Uh -huh. I sat down with them and I expressed that to them. And I mentioned, you know, that what am I actually here to do? So they basically told me, you just do whatever you're told to do. Uh -huh. And I didn't take that very well. And I was maybe 23. Uh -huh. And so I said, look, I'm under an OJT contract. Uh -huh. And the one of the attorneys turned around to me and said, we don't give a shit about your OJT contract. Mm -hmm. You do like you're told. And at that point, I became very bitter. Mm. And I quit. Mm -hmm. And I also decided that I didn't even want to go into law uh -huh. at that stage. So I still needed other alternatives. So I decided I was going to go into the United States Air Force so I could be trained. I could earn money. I could travel. Right. And, uh -huh. and, and as well as pursue my education. Uh -huh. Attempted to get into the Air Force, but the Air Force rejected me because I had a felony. Mm. So they then told me, well, you can go into the army. Uh -huh. So I was about to go into the army. Ronald Reagan was the president at that time, uh -huh. 1984. And at the same time, I was reading the books from the Vedas, like uh -huh. about Hindu philosophy, the philosophy of reincarnation, the philosophy uh -huh. of elevation in consciousness. And I had a choice that either I was going to join the army mm -hmm. or I was going to join the Hindu practices. Uh -huh. I was going to join the meditation religion, join the Hare Krishnas, and I joined the Krishnas. Mm. Wow. Now that was a <laughs> transition. Yes, it was. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -huh. So I was in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. That's mm -hmm. what I chose, as opposed uh -huh. to conforming to what they told me I could do since uh -huh. I couldn't reach my original objective, which uh -huh. is I'll take the air force. They said, no, we're not accepting you there. You have to accept this level down here. I didn't uh -huh. want to do that. So I made a left turn. Okay. Now, did you really pursue that in depth? How long did you really work at that? And how, yeah, how, for, yeah. Yeah. For 17 years. Okay. For 17 years, I was a Hindu priest. I, I practice all my spiritual practices, no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no, no gambling mm. for 17 years. So it was a discipline. It was quite a discipline, especially having not to be able to uh, interact with women because, mm -hmm. you know, that that's my love. I love women, mm -hmm. but I was willing to make that sacrifice as well because I wanted to develop my internal understanding of myself and my spirituality and my connection with God, mm. my connection with the source. So did you leave the country? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. uh, about, about five times. Uh -huh. um, and each time I left the country, I spent about a year in India. Uh -huh. so I spent a year there living in temples, living in uh, villages of India because I really didn't want to spend time in the cities of India because I'm from New York City. Uh -huh. So all the cities that I go to, they all seem to be like imitation New York. Uh -huh. like everybody's trying to be a New York. Yeah. So I had no yeah. interest in that. I wanted to like get down and like get down and dirty. Like how do, 
you know, how do you live here? What's your actual culture? What is mm. the culture here? And in this way, I was able to actually have an incredible alternative experience. Mm. Now that, I tell you, that's a very, many people talk it. I've, I've had a few friends who've gone on the spiritual journey and very few of them really stayed long enough. You know, 17 years, you got into it and, and, and mastered it and became a part of that, that, that experience in a, in a very profound way. So many people, I've had one of my friends went to India and after about six months, the teacher said, you have just too much violence in your heart. You got to go and you got to deal with that. You know, you, you can't connect here. You bring so much violence with you. And um, I think it really hurt him, but I could see it myself, you know, that, that you really had to bring yourself to a point. I guess discipline, discipline seems to be something that young people have a challenge with. How important is that discipline to master yourself? Well, it's like, like you have here, right? The 12 universal laws of success, or you have the 12 disciples, or you have the 12 disciplines. You know, I, I think discipline, I think most people misunderstand discipline as something external, mm. like external rules and regulations. Yeah. I don't really believe that that's what discipline is. The external aspects of discipline are only like guideposts. The, that, that's not really the point. The mm -hmm. point is your voluntary acceptance uh -huh. and, co and controlling yourself to get yourself to where you're trying to go. Yeah. You know, it's just like if you, if you want to go somewhere, you have to have enough discipline. If it takes a train and a bus to get to uh -huh. where you're going, yes. getting on a train, that's discipline. You have to yes. be disciplined enough to get up at the right time, make it to the bus, get on the bus, pay the fare, wait, get off at the right turn, get yes. on the, the train. That's, that's discipline. It's a natural thing. Discipline is a natural thing. But when we view it, like most of the things I believe that we view in this world, we view them in the, upside down. Mm. We don't see the real perspective. Just like we're, we're thinking everything is outside of us. Everything we're trying to pursue, success is all measured by how much I accumulate, by, by how much I have, by what I, what, what I can do. We measure everything that way when actually success is an internal. Mm -hmm. It's an eternal pursuit that no one can measure with a measuring rod. It yeah. can't be measured. Yeah. So I think discipline is very important, but the, a, a natural type of discipline. Mm -hmm. So I think if a person has a clear goal that they really want to attain and that's natural to them, they uh -huh. will have a natural discipline to mm. attain that goal. Mm. Okay. And so that discipline is tied in with desire. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And desire is very powerful. Yes. Right? Yes. Desire yes. is extremely powerful because desire, that's like that magnet that pulls us in mm -hmm. every direction. The desire to eat, the desire for sex, the mm -hmm. desire for fame, the desire for fortune. All these desires are internal. And therefore, they make us act a certain way in our external world. Mm. But when we don't acknowledge that the desires are internal, we still think everything is being triggered from outside of us. The yes. triggers are not outside. They're on the inside. Yes. Man, that self-discipline is key, isn't it? It is. It is. Now, when you came back from... Yeah, you're, you're, you're the 17 years of like spiritual pursuit. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did you write your book and uh, Thoughts for Success after that, after you'd come back or while you were away? No, actually, I wrote that after. Um, uh -huh. and, I, and I didn't write it right away because I think when I came out, I was about 42. Uh -huh. um, and coming out after 17 years of spiritual discipline and uh, voluntary focus 
and a voluntary, uh, let's say, non-association with the things that were going on in the world, when I came out, I was very worldly naive. Uh -huh. Naive about, you, now just imagine, how much did the world change between 1984 uh -huh. and the year 2000? Wow, oh yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So when I came back into the world, I was like practically materially speaking, a caveman uh -huh. because of the evolution and revolution of technology, music, relationships, politics, all these things had changed dramatically. They were actually unrecognizable. And it's not that I wasn't a part of the world, but I lived in a subculture. Uh -huh. The Hindu practices, I lived in temples, mosques. I traveled and I was a missionary and a speaker and a teacher and all of that. But I did not engage in the social life of people. I didn't go to clubs. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to parties. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to sports arenas. I didn't do any of those things. So I was very out of touch, uh -huh. very out of touch with those things. So coming back in, it was a culture shock to me. Mm. It was a cult. Even, even like just to dress, like I didn't even know what style that, that I that I was anymore because yeah. I had been wearing my my devotional garb for years, uh -huh. for many years. Like you may have seen uh, the Hindu monks with uh -huh. their robes. Yeah. I wore robe. Uh -huh. I was wearing robes. I didn't have a wardrobe. Mm -hmm. My wardrobe was robes. Yes. Yes. So now I that, had to reacclimate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that must have been a real experience. So now, wow. I, I, I tell you, Steve, you have such a fascinating life, man. And people don't realize the strength, the, 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 the discipline it takes to do what you have done and to move through it. You know, uh, it's 17 years you take it to the the conclusion you master it and you move back into the world as you came back into the world what was your biggest challenge you know getting timed in and i guess matched up but what did you find was your biggest challenge in getting back into say not just in the world but now how to function in the world how to get things done that you wanted to do relationships mm was the biggest challenge okay it was relating with people who had no inkling of my perspective on life after 17 years of spiritual practices and meditation and introspection and studying and reading and discipline and vegetarian diet and being celibate for 17 years uh -huh. no one could I couldn't plug in with anybody. It, it was like I had nothing in common with the rest of the world, world right? Mm -hmm. we, we had nothing yeah. in common. So yeah. I had to, like an infant, like come in like an infant and then grow back into recognition and grow back into familiarity with the way everybody was moving and doing and the whole thing. I think that was the greatest challenge for me mm. was developing relationships in my condition. You know, I think I was pretty raw, like socially raw. Like I wasn't very highly skilled socially uh -huh. because I had sacrificed that for what I consider to be a greater, a yeah. greater thing. You know, my own self meditation, contemplation, introspection, understanding. Yeah. Well, well, you know, Steve, as you were talking, many of our young people get stuck in a subculture. Just you were in a subculture by choice. Many of them are in a subculture by circumstance and, you know, peer pressure and things like that. But at the end of the at the end of the line, many of them are in the same position of not being able to relate to the world. I mean, you look at some of the uh, some of the young people, some of the you know you have some of the dress, some of the 
I'm always a stickler for dressing a certain kind of way because I don't want people to have to, I want to deal with the essence of what I'm about. I don't want to have to deal with what you think about how I look. I'd rather give you a look that's comfortable for you so I can get what I got to do done. You know, it, it's almost like uh, when I work with young men and I want to tell them, hey, you need to dress a certain kind of way if you're going to get this job. You can't come yes. down there sagging and dragging. It just that Absolutely. they're not going to give you, they're not going to tell you that, but you're just not going to get the job. And so once you make a decision that you need this job, you want to get it, then everything has a price. As you say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yes, sir. And so was there any particular re relationship that helped you move to that next level? Yeah, I, I got married. Mm, okay. And um, I got married, I think I got married personally out of a sense of desperation mm. and, and material frustration and financial frustration. Mm. Because for 17 years, I had pretty much taken a vow of poverty. Uh huh. Right. And I had given up all economic pursuits. I wasn't pursuing anything economically uh -huh. for, you know, for almost 20 years. So when I did, you know, come back into mainstream society, you know, I had to catch up uh -huh. financially. Like, where, you know, where, where is the purse? Where's the yeah. revenue? Where's the income? Where's the money? Where's the, where's the prize? 17 years, where's your prize? Well, well oh. let, me, let, me give you a, let me give you a clue. <laughs> there are many people that have gone on for 17, for 20, for 25 years and still don't have a prize. Still don't. <laughs> okay. They, they, at least you were clear on what you were doing. Many people are just marking time. They, at least for 17 years, you say, I was a priest. There are many people that at this point in their lives, they don't even know what they were. <laughs> for, for <laughs> All they know is they're here now that I'm broke. I don't know where I'm going and, and I'm lost. So it's okay, man. At least you were somewhere you wanted to be. Well, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I met a woman and we communicated and we decided to get married. Oh, I'll tell you the truth. Well, we did decide, but she decided. Uh -huh. Now, she was a lot more mature than me on the material platform and on the uh -huh. worldly platform. Yes. So she had her motives. Uh -huh. I had my motives. Uh -huh. I was using her. She was using me. Right. You know, and in that relationship, I learned a lot about myself. Mm. I learned a lot about my inadequacies. I learned a lot about my weaknesses. Mm. I learned a lot about my personality. You know, the, yeah. the relationship, but there was a lot of conflict in the relationship. And I learned a lot about human nature by living with her. And mm. I learned a lot about human psychology. Mm -hmm. You know, and eventually we wind up divorcing after five years. But that was like my reinitiation. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, back into the mainstream. Uh -huh. Uh huh. That was my reinitiation. Yeah, yes. So I tell you, we have, uh, we've run over an hour, and that's okay because there's so many facets to you and your story, your book. Just tell us a little about Thoughts for Success because I, you know, we were sharing a little before we started and just a little about that. I think that's a, a just a, a, a lovely idea and a great way to approach it. Yeah, Power Thought. Power Thought. Now, the way I titled the book is Power Thought, uh -huh. singular, uh -huh. right? Singular, because even though it is a book of quote unquote power thoughts, right? They're all isolated comments, or statements, or short uh -huh. paragraphs. I named it power of thought because power of thought is a concept. Mm. It's a concept. And the concept of power of thought is that first there is conscious flow. Mm. 
we must recognize and acknowledge our conscious flow. From our conscious flow comes our thought flow, mm -hmm. our mental capacity. Yeah. Our from our thought flow comes our word flow. Mm -hmm. Our word flow, and from our word flow comes our ink flow. Right, mm -hmm. and from there we can actually create cash flow. Mm -hmm. Right, so the I, power thought, the purpose of power thought is actually to provoke people to think for themselves. Mm. It's meant as a provocateur. Mm -hmm. It is not meant to tell people what they should think. Mm -hmm. I have no interest in telling people what they should think or what they should believe. Uh, I, I believe that that is a personal choice. Uh -huh. But I do think that we could help each other by stimulating each other to think, mm. to, get, to get the wheels churning. So the yeah. way I designed the book, actually one of the other concepts behind it was I said, I want to write a book that people who don't like to read would like. Mm, okay. And that's why I formatted it the way I did. Okay. I remember I was um, speaking to a college student. I was driving a taxi and speaking to a college student. And, and a college student said to me, every time I see a paragraph, I get sleepy. That's what he said. Wow. So I said, okay, when I write my book, there will not be any long paragraphs. paragraphs. They're all mm -hmm. going to be short statements. And each mm -hmm. one of those statements are meant to stimulate. Uh -huh. They are like, it's like an injection. So you can simply open a book, get your injection, your, your pep, and move on. move on. And that's the basic idea behind Power uh -huh. Thought. Wow. Okay, beautiful. Well, I tell you, that's a book that people need to take a look at, man. Really, really. Thank you. So now let's see. I know what I want. A couple questions. What are you most proud of? What do you consider your greatest victory to date? I'll be most proud of. The thing I'm most proud of, that's a good question. I am very proud of the fact that I have come to realize and come to give up a lot of the ambivalence and a lot of the bad feelings that I had towards my mother mm. and towards my father. Uh -huh. I, am, I am glad that I was able to resolve that. I had a really serious inner conflict. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of the fact that I have overcome many, many inner conflicts that I had as a person, as a child, so I'm very, I'm very proud of that fact that I was able to overcome those things because now it allows me to access new aspects of myself, mm -hmm. resilience in myself that I would not be able to access if I was not able to resolve those internal conflicts. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Now, I'm, you know, and I may be going too far, but what do you think was the source of that internal conflict between you and your parents? Well, one, it was that my, my father was murdered when I was about four. Mm. And I saw my father's uh, destroyed body in the casket. And it left a, like a physical, um, horrible memory on my mind and on my brain. My father was actually beaten to death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not because that he was wrong or that he was a bad person. He was actually a good person. He was actually known as like Honest John. My, my father loved my mother, uh -huh. loved my mother sincerely and wanted to care for her and take care of her. But my mother had a different nature. Uh -huh. My mother was, a lot more promiscuous and, and a partier and so forth. So I had, there was some ambivalence there. So when, after my father was murdered and my mother died when I was about 13, she died of breast cancer. Mm. And I think I harbored feelings of abandonment. Mm. Wow. Okay. That I was, I was abandoned. 
And even though I didn't have, um, I didn't have real anger towards my father, but I did later on realize that I did feel negative that my father left so early, even though I know it wasn't his fault, uh -huh. but I did, he was gone, you yeah. know, and I was four. So uh -huh. I had to come to some kind of conclusion at four. And it was an ambivalent conclusion, which I was able to address later with both my mother and my father. Mm. Hold one second. Yes, sir. Let me call you back. I'll cut that out. <laughs> yeah, we can edit that. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, that was such a profound... Um, mm. As a child, you know, it's very interesting. So often as children see the world from where they are, you know, yes. my, I know my daughter was raised by her mother. And even though I felt I was a great provider and all those good things and whatnot, but I was on the road a lot. And so when I would come home, it would take her two or three days to just warm up to me. And, you know, I, I'm from the point of view, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing the other. But so often they just see it even, uh, one of my friend's daughter was sharing, you know, when they got a chance to talk, that even though the mother was a single parent, she was working two jobs, the daughter just saw it from the perspective that she wasn't there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And you, you were able to get through that. That's I, I tell you something, Steve, you have done some incredible work internally. Yeah. And well, that, that, that is truly a great victory. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I think, because I know that um, I, when I was reading your email, you know, that you, you had a question in there about what is your greatest accomplishment, mm -hmm. right? And I thought about that. And my conclusion is my greatest accomplishment is being exhibited right now. Mm. I was invited mm -hmm. by Dr. Herbert Harris. I was invited by a great personality, a great accomplished elder, an, an exquisite example, a an, an super intelligent person, accomplished person, a black man, a, a true icon in the real sense, not in this whole celebrity thing, but in a true sense, who, who, ha who has left a trail, a trail of success, a trail of messages and lessons and examples and books and, and, and audio. I mean, to me, this is the culmination of all my accomplishments. Mm. That I, that my life has thus far come to the point where a person like you would actually invite me to interview me. That up to this point is the greatest accomplishment of my life. Well, I thank you, my brother. Well, I truly, you are truly worthy and truly have lived a life of example yourself. You know, as we go back, we'll listen and to this interview and you'll hear many nuggets that there are so many people who have been faced with some of the same challenges but went the other way and yes, you sir. you managed to find you know no matter how much darkness there is there's light somewhere <laughs> <laughs> that's right you know and so you always found the light and and i think i i have two questions one and I think you're perfectly positioned to answer. The one question was, based on where you are right now, what advice would you give your younger self? Advice I would give my younger self uh -huh. is to seek out mentorship, mm. seek out guidance, learn to one, trust yourself. Mm and find someone else you can trust. Mm. Seek out mentorship and find right. someone you can trust. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Life is a team sport. Mm. It's a team sport. Now that, let me tell you something, that right there is a diamond. Because we look at the young folks so many times, and you know, we taught for a while in, in public housing and other areas, and it just seemed like that that many times, I think Harriet Tubman said, she said, I could have freed a lot more slaves if they knew that they were slaves. Yes. <laughs> so many times our young people don't know that they don't know to even seek answers and seek mentorship. And so that's a, that's a, that's a powerful piece of advice to give to a younger person. I'd like to go back now. You're at a point now at 63 and when you're 92. Yes. What advice would you give yourself at 92? Okay, at 92, all right. So projecting on, if mm -hmm. I do a projection of myself, the advice that I would give is that the, the greatest value that a person can have is their self-image. Mm. That's the greatest value. That, yes. that you can have is, is your self-image, not the image that's superimposed mm. on, on us. Ah. Wow. The self-image. And I think that that's, that's the real diamond. Like there's a statement that says, you know, that it was a great breakthrough when people said, your health is your wealth. That was like a breakthrough, a momentous, uh, occasion you know lights were going on but i came to another conclusion you know where lights came on you know you have that moment that yes your health is your wealth but yourself is your greatest wealth Ooh. well that's another way of saying was the great philosopher know thyself Know thyself. Mm. Yourself is your greatest wealth. Woo! Mm, mm, mm. Steve, <laughs> you've been dropping pearls, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we have this great diamond feel here. I mean, you dropped some serious pearls. That, you know, it's funny when you hear a, a profound truth, it sounds so simple, but it's yeah. so impactful. Yeah, man, man. Well, I tell you, Steve, uh, we're gonna wrap up shortly. And yes, you sir. said so many things. I, I, I tell you, man, it's just uh, I'm impressed. I'm super impressed. I love, I love a person who has chased their dream, and not just, you know, like there's people who moonwalk after their dreams. They they look like they're moving forward, but they're really not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but where you believe something and then you went to do it when you go to become a monk and, and go into that for 17 years that's a critical that's a self-discipline that's a, a vision that you have of yourself that's a commitment that's a dedication and that in itself is a lesson yes sir you see for this next part of your life the fact that you had all of those tools to do that now has prepared you for this moment going forward. You could not go forward without all the, the tools that you have accumulated and mastered. And so go, going forward now, you see, as they say, everybody has a David and Goliath moment. Goliath, right. is, gonna, Goliath is gonna take a whipping. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wow. That's right. Wow, man. Yeah. Well, I, 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 yes. Yeah, no, I can just honestly say, you know, that I love you, Dr. Harris. You know, love you, man. Everything that you have done, everything that you are providing us with, all the light, you're bringing light. Thank you, my you know? friend. And that's what we need. We need the light because so many of us are in darkness. Wow. We're in darkness, some deep, deep darkness. And we need people like you 
bring in the light. Bring the light. Well, I should thank you. And the uh, any thoughts on the 12 universal laws of success? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I love these principles. I love these principles, you know, and I've been listening to the audio. Uh-huh. You know, I think it's just so essential that we have principles. You know, we, we call them laws. I also refer to them as principles. Yes. That our life, we need to have principles because principles don't change. Right, right. Right. The laws don't change. We need something that's changeless in a world where everything keeps changing. Mm. And that's how that's why we become confused and bewildered because everything is constantly changing. That's the yeah. only thing that doesn't change in this world is that it keeps changing, constantly changing. Yeah. It's like it's like a it's, it's like, you know, people are in camouflage. Right. You know, this guy was a man last week. Damn it. He's a woman this week. Like what the yes. hell is going on? Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like a like a freak show, like a uh. magic freak show. And if we don't have any principles. Mm. Yes. We're going to be bewildered. Yes. Wow. We will be bewildered. So yes. I think your 12 universal laws of success, what they do is they give us those eternal principles. Mm. that we need and that we can actually hang on to that's yeah. not going to change whether you change your name from david to doris yes. these principles don't change yes we yes. we need something changeless yes. something got to be or else nothing's true that's there's so no true. truth wow wow well, you man, you hit the nail on the head and knocked it out of the park <laughs> you know and your and your last principle is true Truth. That's the, the last truth. principle. Oh, yes. Well, man, I appreciate you. Any final words you would like to share? You know, we've covered a lot, but any thoughts that you want to share with our audience before we wrap up? Um, no, just that um maybe one day I'd like to get the opportunity to interview you. Well, That's we're gonna something. do that. We're gonna do that. I, I'll tell you something, Stephen. I have enjoyed, I consider you a fellow traveler. You Thank know, you. With, on the highway of life, man, there, there are people who are sitting by the side of the road. There are people ahead of you and there are people behind you. But the people who are most important are those who travel with you. And I consider wow. you a fellow traveler. Wow. Now that, that's it. That, that is my validation right there. If I needed any validation, <laughs> that is a validation for me right there. Because that's... That's that's what I want to be, you know. I, I want to be, I want to be a contributor. Yes. I want to be a participant. Yes. I don't want to be sitting in the bleachers, you know, throwing things and you know, oh yeah, that was a good move. No, I want to make moves. Yes. I want to take risks. Yes. Yes. I want the losses and the victories. Wow. I want them all. Well, it is done. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen Hutchison. Let me tell you something, folks. This has been a great interview. I thank you so much. We're going to do some more. And to our listeners, this is one of those interviews, one of those success talks that you're going to want to listen to over and over because there's so many. It's almost like a, a calico cat. There's so many different colors. And when you look at it up close, it seems one way. When you look at it from afar, it seems another. But this is one of those interviews that you're going to find some incredible nuggets. So thank you for being with us for another edition of Success Talk. Thank you, Steve, for sharing. And we know this, that we can, you can be what you want to be. You can do what you want to do. You can have anything you desire, always knowing that the best is yet is to yet come. To come. <laughs> so it is. Right on. Peace. Peace.